you know, we've seen many disastrous things, uh, even if we don't personally uh, experience them. We've seen them on our TV screens. We've seen rivers being destroyed. We've seen viruses wiping out pigs, uh, such as with the, uh, with the swine flu and uh, other such diseases. Uh, we've seen plagues of insects destroying crops. And whenever things like this happen, it's common to say that it's a plague of biblical proportions. Uh, no doubt that's because the story of the plagues in the Bible is something that is relatively well known to us and to our world. But I wonder whether you are here this morning and you kind of know the, the story of the plagues uh, in the book of Exodus. You know it as a historical reality. But you're asking yourself, well, what does all this have to do with me this morning? You know, I've traveled a long way uh, in the cold to be at church here this morning. Uh, I've got lots of things in my mind that are weighing me down at the moment. Uh, I'm exhausted from the week. What does all this mention of the plagues have to do with me? Uh, well, if that's you this morning, uh, I want to encourage you to see that God has some very important things to say to us uh, in these chapters. Uh, not only do the plagues resurface in the book of Revelation, which we saw um, a few series ago, um, it resurfaces to describe God's judgment on humanity, uh, both now in the present as well as the future. But right in the middle of these chapters, in the middle of chapters 7 to 11 of Exodus, God says the extraordinary thing that these plagues are meant to help us to know him better. The purpose of these plagues is so that people like you and me would know uh, the God of heaven and earth. And I can't think of a more important thing for us this morning to be looking at than to know God in our lives. Uh, now, if we di uh, dive into today's passage, uh, you can see there that Pharaoh, who is the king of Egypt, is locked down uh, in a showdown with God. Uh, we saw last week, didn't we, that Pharaoh doesn't listen to God's command to let the people of Israel go from slavery in Egypt. Uh, well, you can see there uh, that this morning that this conflict is continuing in these chapters. Uh, Moses and his brother Aaron keep on confronting Pharaoh, demanding that he let uh, his people go. But it's important to see that it's not simply Moses and Aaron speaking to Pharaoh at this point. Uh, it's God himself who is confronting Pharaoh. Well, you can see there in chapter 7, verse 1, have a look with me at chapter 7, verse 1, that God says to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. In other words, what Moses says to Pharaoh is what God is saying to Pharaoh. As Moses confronts Pharaoh, it is God confronting Pharaoh. However, what is obvious as you read through this passage is that Pharaoh continues again and again and again to disobey what God is saying to him. He continues to disobey God's clear and simple and direct word that is addressed to him, which is, let my people go. Now, you might have noticed that this ongoing disobedience is described as Pharaoh having a, a hard heart against God. It's quite a striking image, isn't it? His heart is like a stone. Uh, it's unresponsive to God's word. It refuses to be moved by the things that God is saying to him. And Pharaoh, in his pride, is determined not to yield, not to obey, not to do the things that he knows God is asking of him. But who is responsible for this hard-heartedness in Pharaoh? Uh, well, during the week I counted that uh, between chapters 7 to 11, uh, Pharaoh's heart is described as being hard 15 times. Uh, six of those times, it is God who is doing the hardening. Uh, three of those times, it is Pharaoh himself who is doing the hardening. And another six of those times, uh, Pharaoh's heart itself seems to be doing the hardening. 
And so what this is saying is that God, on the one hand, is sovereign over Pharaoh's choice to disobey God. God is the one who is in control. And yet at the same time, Pharaoh himself is also responsible for the way that he is deciding against God, such that God's judgment of him is entirely fair. Notice that this hardening of heart is a gradual thing for Pharaoh. Each and every time God sends a plague and then relents of that plague, Pharaoh decides to postpone his obedience to God's word. Perhaps he's thinking to himself, well, tomorrow I might decide a little bit differently, but today I'm going to stubbornly refuse to do what God says. He also decides to bargain with God. If you've read the narrative of uh, chapter 7 to 11 during the week, you notice that uh, Pharaoh decides to bargain with God in his life, trying to change the terms that God has laid down for him. The tragedy, of course, is that gradually Pharaoh's heart begins to set, and towards the end he is so hardened that he goes beyond the point of no return with God. Uh, Towards the end of our passage, in chapter 10, verse 28, uh, chapter 10, verse 28, he says to Moses, who, if you remember, is like God to Pharaoh, Pharaoh says to Moses, get away from me. Take care never to see my face again, for on the day you see my face, you shall die. It is a threat against God. Uh, Some of you might know the extraordinary story of Hiru Onada, uh, which I've told a few times at church. Uh, Onada was a Japanese soldier during World War II. During the war, he was sent to a strategic location in a a jungle in the Philippines, and the last command that he was given by his commanding officer was to stand and fight at all costs. And so that's what Onada did. He refused to lay down his arms. He stubbornly kept on fighting the Americans alone. He killed anyone who came into the jungle. However, the thing that Anada didn't realize was that World War II was over by this stage. Japan had surrendered and lost the war, but he still refused to lay down his arms. He continued to stubbornly fight on. Uh, they actually tried to drop leaflets uh, from uh, a a helicopter into the jungle, saying that the war was over. But when he read the leaflets, he refused to believe it. They sent Japanese people into the jungle to tell him that the war was over. He refused to believe it. It was only 29 years after the end of the war that they managed to track down his original commanding officer, who was at this stage, selling books somewhere in Japan, to go back to the Philippines to tell him that it was all over. Now, friends, that's a small window into the kind of world that we live in, isn't it? You know, God has won the victory. Jesus has died on the cross, uh, triumphing over all. He has risen to be the Lord of all things who rules this world without question. The war is over, and yet this world stubbornly refuses to believe and acknowledge the one who rules it. It refuses to obey him, and it continues in its hard-heartedness to reject him year after year after year. But it's not just out there in the world, is it, friends? For if you are anything like me, you will know how easy it is to begin hardening our hearts against God. You know, you hear the truth of God's word week after week, perhaps at church, perhaps in growth groups, perhaps in your own reading of the scriptures. You know exactly what God is saying. It's clear. It's direct. It's simple. And yet you choose deliberately not to follow that truth and serve God thinking that you can just perhaps wait until tomorrow. There will come a day when I will do those sort of things. Today, I'll just 
ignore what God says. I'll go out of these doors not having done anything about the things that I'm hearing. Well, because I've got other idols to worship in my life at the moment. I'll just postpone really giving my all to serve and worship God because it's just inconvenient for me at the moment. Perhaps tomorrow I'll do, God what, uh, do what God says. But today I'll bargain with God so that rather than obeying him wholeheartedly, I'll just kind of do the bare minimum in my life. I might just see how far I can go not doing what he says to see whether that's okay. Uh, Listen to what Christopher Ashe, who is a UK pastor, writes about this kind of hardening of heart. He says, What the Bible calls hardness of heart is the same as a persistent rejection of conscience, knowing in my heart that something is true, but deliberately not following that truth, at least for now. In some ways, the most deceitful thing about hardness of heart is its gradual nature. It usually consists of a series of little rejections masquerading as postponements. And yet, as with all forms of addictive behaviour, each rejection makes it harder to turn back. Uh, Friends, do you and I find ourselves alarmed when we find ourselves disobeying God and hardening our hearts against him? You know, we ought to be. If, If you find yourself hardening your heart against God, there should be all sorts of alarm bells ringing in your mind. If you find God hardening your heart, then it should actually terrify you and me. It should terrify us so much that we cannot do anything else but to turn back to God with a great deal of urgency, asking him to give us soft hearts that want to obey him fully, that want to love him, that want to serve him and his people in our lives. And friends, that is the kind of request that God will always hear and that is the kind of request that God will always answer. There's a well-known saying that says, the hardest substance known to man is man's heart. The softest substance known to man is God's heart. Now, if you know that you've been hardening your heart against God, or God is saying to you this morning, Do something about it. Don't let that keep on happening until you find yourself with very little reason to turn back. Do something about it today. Now it's obvious, isn't it, that God's response to Pharaoh and Egypt's hard-heartedness are the ten plagues that he sends to the people of Egypt. Uh, If you run your eye quickly uh, across the different plagues, Uh, You can see what they are, can't you? We won't have time to read through uh, all uh, five chapters this morning. But uh, you can see what they are. God turns the Nile into blood. He sends frogs. He sends gnats. He sends flies. He destroys Egyptian livestock. He causes boils and sores to come upon Egyptian flesh. He sends hail. He sends locusts. He sends light. uh, Sorry, he turns light into darkness. And uh, next week we will see the final uh, climactic and unique plague, which is the death of the firstborn uh, throughout all of Egypt. Uh, It is true that skeptics and liberal Christians have often denied the miraculous nature uh, of these plagues. Uh, Some, for example, say that the Nile River didn't really turn into blood. It just looked like blood because, well, perhaps the the sediment at the bottom of the river was red in colour or there was an algae um, sort of bloom happening that uh, turned the water red. Uh, Now, I just want to say that if God is the one who created the galaxies and if God is the one who created flesh and blood, then surely it's not that hard to imagine that God can turn a river uh, into blood. 
But to leave us in no doubt, this part of Exodus keeps on mentioning that God is the one who sets the time of the plagues. I don't know whether you noticed that if you've uh, read through those chapters. But uh, what you are meant to see is that this is no, no fluke. God sends the plague uh, in his own timing. He predicts when they are going to happen. Uh, at times he even says to Pharaoh, you decide when, that, when uh, I'll stop the plagues. And he stopped the, stops the plagues. This is the finger of God at work. However, I wonder whether you've pondered why there are nine plagues. I mean, it's really the tenth plague, isn't it, that kind of uh, forces Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go. Um, this seems a, a little bit uneconomical. Uh, to go through all ten plagues. Uh, why are there nine plagues before he gets to the, to the tenth? Uh, well, if you turn with me to chapter 9, verse 14, uh, turn in your Bibles with me to uh, chapter 9, verse 14. You can see the answer there in what God says to Pharaoh. Chapter 9, verse 14. I think these verses are at the heart of what this part of Exodus is all about. He says, from verse 14. For this time I will send all my plagues on you myself and on your servants and your people. This is uh, God addressing Pharaoh. So that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now I could have put, my, put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. In other words, the reason why God sends these plagues is so that Egypt and all the surrounding nations around Egypt would come to know who God really is and coming to know who God really is, they would put their trust in him and find salvation. They would put their trust in him and begin obeying him. Uh, what did they come to know about God through these plagues? Well, the first thing they came to know is that Israel's God, the Lord, was the one and only God in this world. Now, you see a glimpse of this in the prelude to the plagues, uh, you know, before God sends the ten plagues, uh, he, set, he, he does a, a sign or a miracle just before he starts doing the ten plagues, where he tells Aaron to throw down his staff before Pharaoh, and, uh, you know, the staff turns into a serpent. Um, after that, the, the magicians of Pharaoh uh, throw down their own staffs, and they, they all um, turn into serpents. But what happens? Well, uh, Aaron's staff, which is now a serpent, sort of gobbles up all the other serpents or snakes. What is going on here? Uh, well, in ancient Egypt, serpents were a common symbol for the gods. Uh, that's why uh, you see, um, you know, on the crowns of, of, of the pharaohs, um, a cobra uh, on, on the crown. It's because they were considered to be gods among all the other gods of Egypt. And so what God is saying here is that he is going to be the one who utterly destroys every god in the land of Egypt so that there will be no doubt as to who is really the true and living God. And I don't know whether you realize this, but each of the plagues is actually meant to symbolize God's defeat of the, of the Egyptian gods. You know, the Egyptians had gods for everything. They had a god of the Nile. They had a god who had the head of a frog. He looked like a frog. They had a god who looked like a bull. They had a god who healed them of sickness, including boils. They even had a sun god. These are the gods that they put their trust in for their health and for fertility and for prosperity in life. Just like our world has its gods of money and sex and hedonistic pleasure that we look to for security and prosperity and the good life, 
Well, Egypt had, had its own gods that it turned to. But what does God do? Well, he turns the Nile into blood. He commands the frogs to do his bidding. He destroys the livestock. He sends boils upon human flesh that the Egyptian gods can do nothing about. He turns light into darkness. What God is doing here is he is showing his power and his might over every other god in Egypt. What he is saying is, I am the one and only God, and so give up your idols, give up your gods, and put your trust in me. This is a warning not to harden your heart against this God. This is a warning not to turn to false gods and put your trust in them, but to put your trust in the one and only God who who brings calamity on the ones who oppose him, but freedom and life for those who trust him. Uh, Later on in the book of Joshua, as Israel is about to enter the promised land, it seems that the nations uh, all around have been hearing about this God. And they are terrified of him. You remember Rahab the prostitute in Joshua, in the beginning of of Joshua, uh, when she meets the Israelite spies? Uh, This is what she says. She says, I know that the Lord has given you the land. And the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of you. I wonder how people will respond if these plagues fell upon the city of Sydney. I mean, imagine Sydney Harbour turning into blood. Imagine an infestation of frogs and gnats and flies that are crawling all over your homes, our homes, and in our offices. Imagine all our pet animals just falling dead. Imagine hail the size of soccer balls destroying the city. Imagine darkness descending on the city in the middle of the day. How do you think our city would respond if these these things happened? Would people turn from their idols and false gods and begin to worship the one and only God? Or would they simply tell each other to be strong, we'll get through this, and simply get on with life? But you don't need a plague to warn you of these things, do you? God can send many reminders that he is the one and only God and one day you and I will have to give an account for our lives before him. A number of years ago it was reported that David Beckham and his family were holidaying in the Maldives. Uh, They were staying in an exclusive seven-star hotel. I didn't even know there were seven stars, uh, but I thought five was the limit. But as they were sitting on their exclusive beach, picking seashells and building sandcastles and sunbathing on a perfect day, suddenly a corpse just rolled in with the waves. You see, not even your money or your fame or the comfortable life that we build for ourselves will be able to protect us from the death that is sure to come, and the judgment that is sure to follow. And so what God is saying is to repent from our hardness of heart. Give up your idols. Put your trust in the one and only God. Listen to him. Obey him. Don't put it off. Do it today. And so the plagues reveal that Israel's God is the one and only God. But here's the wonderful thing. It also reveals that Israel's God is a gracious and wonderful and majestic saviour. 
Now, you can see that God is a gracious saviour to the people of Israel. Uh, For in the plagues, you may have noticed that God protects the people of Israel. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, You can see this most clearly in the the fourth plague, uh, which is when God sends a swarm of flies to destroy and ruin Egypt. But if you turn uh, with me to chapter 8, verse 22, chapter 8, verse 22, you'll see there that God prevents the flies from destroying the place, the very place where the Israelites are living. Uh, It says there, 8, 22, But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies will be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. You see, it's it's astonishing. It's almost as though God draws a ring around the people of Israel and says, nothing can touch my people. It happens not only with the plague of flies, but it happens with the plague of livestock. God destroys the livestock of Egypt, but preserves the livestock of Israel. It also happens with the plague of hail. God sends hail to destroy uh, anyone who is outside, people and animals who belong to Egypt. But God preserves the people and animals of Israel. Uh, so, yeah, Israel. And finally, it also happens with the plague of darkness. In an extraordinary way, God sends darkness on Egypt as a sign of his judgment. And yet where the Israelites live, it's still shining with light. However, here's the thing. It's not only the people of Israel who are saved by God in the Exodus. But it's also some of the people of Egypt who fear God and start to do what he says. You get a little glimpse of this in the plague of hail. You know, God promises to send hail to destroy um, Egypt. And yet in chapter 9, verse 20, you see there that some of, some of Pharaoh's servants begin to fear the Lord. They trust his word. And because they believe what God is saying, they, they bring their servants and their animals inside and they are spared. Later on in the Exodus itself, we read in uh, chapter 12, verse 38, that not only does Israel depart from the land of Egypt to their freedom, but we are also told that a mixed multitude A mixed multitude also leaves Egypt with the people of Israel. In other words, it seems as though there were some Egyptians, those who once were the very enemies of God, who begin to see that God is the one and only God, and they put their trust in him, and they find freedom and salvation together with the people of Israel. And so, friends, the plagues reveal something about God, don't they? They tell us that God is the one and only God. And so God was sending a loud and clear message to his enemies that their only hope was to abandon their own gods and to put their trust in him. Now, if that is true of God's revelation of himself in the Exodus, how much more true is it, friends, of God's final and climactic and ultimate revelation of himself in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus came into this world, he did not come bringing plagues. He came bringing grace. He healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He raised the dead. Ultimately, he went to the cross where, just like in the plagues, darkness descended in the middle of the day. Why? Well, it was because he was paying the penalty of God's judgment for us. He was dying in our place, in your place, in my place, paying the penalty that you and I deserve for hardening our hearts against him and refusing to do what he says so that we might be forgiven to enjoy freedom and eternal life. What a gracious saviour 
we have in Jesus. And it is this same Jesus who rose from the dead, showing that he is now the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the God of gods, the one and only God who offers you forgiveness and eternal life, who offers forgiveness and life if you turn to trust him and to obey him, to obey him in your life and in my life. You cannot find salvation in anyone else apart from coming to him on his terms. That's why the Apostle Peter says in the book of Acts that there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Make no mistake, friends, if those who hardened their hearts in Egypt did not escape God's judgment in the Exodus, you will not escape God's judgment if you harden your heart against this Jesus. And so how are you responding to him in your life, in my life? Are we listening to him? Are we doing more than simply playing the religious game, but actually listening to him and obeying him? What are the things that you know Jesus wants from you that you keep postponing in your life again and again and again? What are the things that you find yourself bargaining with God about because you want to do the bare minimum or because you're thinking to yourself, I'll just push this as far as I can go and see what happens. Perhaps you keep on making excuses not to serve Jesus and to live his way because you are really, in your heart, chasing after the idols and the false gods of this world. If that's you, then God is saying loudly and clearly this morning, don't go that way. Turn back from that direction and come to him. Trust him. Obey him. For to do nothing is to harden your heart against God a little bit more. You see, listening to God's word is not a neutral thing. It's a dangerous thing. For to listen to him and obey him brings you nearer to life and joy and a right knowledge of God. But to keep stubbornly resisting and postponing and making excuses week after week, day after day, only makes your heart even harder and takes you away from him. And so, will you listen to him this morning? Will you put your trust in him? Will you make decisions in your life so that you do not leave the, these doors this morning having done nothing about the things that you've heard? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a God who has revealed yourself finally and fully and fantastically in our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is our gracious saviour who gave up his life for us and for our sins, for our hard-heartedness. And we thank you that he is the risen one, that he has risen as the one and only Lord who rules over all things. And Father, we thank you that you speak so clearly to us about Jesus and what it looks like to follow him in your word. Now forgive us for so often hardening our hearts and following other gods and postponing obedience such that we do the bare minimum. Help us to feel the weight of responding to you in this way and change our hearts so that we might follow Christ wholeheartedly and responsibly and obediently in our lives.
And Father, we thank you that you are a God who desires not judgment, but salvation. Thank you that you, uh, through the plagues and ultimately through our Lord Jesus, want people to know you and to trust you and to obey you. And thank you that you are a God who delights in turning your enemies into your friends through the work of the gospel. And so we pray that you would help us to do just that, to keep on turning to you in trust and obedience so that we might live in a manner worthy of you, our one and only God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.